everybody. Hello, guys. Welcome to our second lecture uh, in this year's IEO. And right now we have with us uh, Manas Mansaganis. He is a professor of public finance at the Polytechnic University of Milan. Uh, welcome, Manas. Thank you very much for joining us this year. And I'm giving the stage to you now. Thank you so much. Oops. Uh, all right. Um, hello, everybody. It's so good to be uh, talking to you uh, this afternoon. My uh, talk, if I manage to, yeah, here we are. Uh, my talk is titled uh, Does Automation and uh, Artificial Intelligence uh, Spell the End of Work? Uh, which is, you may think, a rather uh, technical and um, uh, specific question rather than what you might have expected. But uh, I thought about several topics and uh, I thought that uh, perhaps it is a good idea um, to use this uh, topic in order to illustrate uh, that uh, economics um, is often known as a combination of common sense and jargon. So if you remove the jargon, which is what I'm uh, hoping to do, uh, what is left is common sense. And I'm sure that all of you have plenty of that. So um, you may think of economics as, uh, as a field of scientific inquiry. Uh, so it is a set of theories and a, and a set of empirical approaches, let's say tools that help you understand how the economy works. But in a broader sense, uh, economics is also an approach that uh, one can use to uh, shed light on the most pressing issues of the day. Um, so I teach at the Polytechnic University of Milan. My students are not uh, economic students. They study architecture uh, and urban uh, studies. Uh, and uh, my uh, way of teaching uh, the various courses uh, is not to try and turn them into economists, which would be uh, an entire uh, failure, but to help them see how economics can help them make sense of the world around them. So uh, I'm sure you can do that even better. And this is why I chose uh, such a demanding topic. So uh, let me go straight to the point. Uh, my talk today is about uh, technology and how it affects uh, the labor market. Um, and of course, when you think of technology in recent months, you probably think of artificial intelligence. AI was around for a few years, but it really um, erupted on the scene uh, since uh, chat GPT, which you may have used uh, for instance, to, you know, to, to help you with your essays, uh, became public and uh, free of charge uh, also. Uh, I mean, you know, the, the, the public version, which is a rather reduced version of what ChatGPT can do if you pay a bit more, uh, only last no November. So uh, less than eight months ago, right? It's a very new thing. And um, it has caused quite a lot of soul searching, uh, including from people who were uh, active in uh, developing uh, AI a few years ago. So uh, there was this open letter uh, in uh, the Financial Times um, of a number of uh, people who signed it, uh, who um, argued that uh, AI experiments pose a profound risks to society and even humanity. And for this reason, they called for an immediate pause on, on such experiments. All right, but wh what exactly is AI? Well, you may think of it 
don't 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 think that I'm an expert in AI. I'm trying to make sense of it uh, as much as everybody else, except those who are really experts. But these are very few. So uh, I think the best way of thinking about artificial technology, uh, artificial intelligence, is as a as a system which is machine based uh, that can influence uh, the environment. You know, it can uh, take an active uh, role uh, in producing predictions or recommendations or decisions uh, for some objectives. So think of it as, uh, as a technology that uses algorithms and statistics, say machine learning and big data, in order to answer questions known as prompts, right? These questions may be extremely absurd, like, uh, you know, please compose um, uh, an order uh, of, um, you know, compose a job application letter uh, in the style of, uh, I don't know, uh, an ancient uh, writer, you know, whatever. It can be, you know, compose a love letter uh, in the style of uh, Napoleon or whatever, you know, it could be something completely absurd or it could be quite uh, sensible, uh, right? You know, help me with my essay preparation, which is, I don't know, um, how Europe changed after the First World War. You know, it could be anything. Basically, it draws on data that are texts and other information already uh, on the web and uh, creates answers based to do the question based on, on the information that is already available. And, you know, it can be quite creative. It can even use, let's say, works of art, not exactly original works of art, but, you know, digital art that may be quite persuasive. Uh, or it can do very effectively computer programming. You know, things like that. And many other things that we haven't yet discovered. And uh, of course, the um, spooky thing is, is that AI systems are uh, designed to operate with cert a certain level of autonomy. So there are experts who claim that uh, artificial intelligence will be the next general purpose technology. What is a general purpose technology? Well, it is those technologies that have not just affected uh, a production uh, process uh, or a particular uh, industry, but are all purpose. You know, they are used very widely, like electricity, for instance, uh, or the internal combustion engine, which is uh, used or used to be used uh, for automobiles. Uh, or the internet, for that matter. You know, the internet is not something that only computer scientists use, but everybody. So these are general purpose technology uh, technologies, and uh, some people claim that AI will be one of them. So its effects will be pretty profound. So given this, um, its potential for... Uh, uh, to, to, to substitute uh, human labor, you know, to do what workers uh, did up to now uh, is quite significant. And uh, that means uh, that um, um, depending on how this plays out, um, or at least from the point of view of some people, uh, this may negatively affect uh, wages, depressing them, and jobs, reducing them. We don't really know if all this uh, anxiety is justified, but it is very pervasive. So there is this 
recent survey of the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development that showed that uh, around 40% of workers uh, interviewed for this uh, survey uh, working in manufacture and finance thought uh, that their wages would decrease over the next 10 years because of artificial technology. So I'm not in a position to tell you whether this anxiety uh, is justified and whether uh, wages will really decrease and jobs will really be lost. Uh, over the next uh, few years. And I don't think anybody is in a position to say that with any certainty. The truth is that we don't know, right? But I think it's important to remember that there is nothing new about the anxiety that technology will cause mass unemployment. We've been here before, and I'd like to take you uh, on a journey to history, which is often very illuminating. So for instance, uh, what, 30 years ago, uh, James Rifkin uh, wrote a book uh, titled The End of Work, which predicted pretty much uh, a rather uh, dismal uh, future in which uh, there was less and less work available and masses of people uh, were threatened with unemployment. And then there was this wonderful and pretty scary study by Brin Olson and McAfee, uh, both researchers at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, almost 10 years ago, uh, in which they pointed out that the transition to, the, to a digital economy is likely to bring a lot of economic disruption. So companies will, will have less need for some types of skills and workers. And this progress is going to be so fast that some people will be left behind, perhaps a lot of people. Then two uh, researchers at, the, uh, at Oxford University uh, estimated 10 years ago um, that almost half of all workers in the United States uh, face a high risk of automation. In other words, they face a probability of being replaced by computers and algorithms of over 70% over the next 10 to 20 years. You know, pretty bleak uh, predictions. But as I said earlier, we have been here before. Uh, let's start with the 20th century, last century. Well, you know, there was a cyclical thing, almost uh, this uh, anxiety that technological change will cause mass unemployment. So uh, there was this uh, essay uh, five years ago by Luc Sutter, uh, a Belgian uh, expert in innovation policy, who pointed out that in the 1970s and 1980s, when the new thing was microelectronics, uh, people started to refer uh, to uh, the literature of the 1930s and 1940s about uh, the spectrum of permanent technological unemployment. And it's interesting to see that unlike today, there was more anxiety in Europe in the 1980s uh, than in the US. And in any case, the debate quickly shifted to a more positive vision. Uh, Luc Sauter uh, referred to the literature, the economics literature, and also, uh, you know, the press uh, in the 1930s and 1940s. And of course, uh, in economics, uh, that was a time uh, when um, 
the economics literature was dominated by John Maynard Keynes, uh, the uh, British economist uh, who uh, made uh, left such a mark on the way we think uh, about economics. So he wrote this wonderful uh, article. I think it was an article in the Times uh, of London, uh, the newspaper, uh, which was then reprinted as a chapter in a book. And uh, it was titled Economic Possibilities of Our Grandchildren. And, uh, you know, in this article, uh, Keynes um, started from um, a debate that was raging at the time, uh, you know, perhaps perhaps you recall that uh, 1930 was a rather bad year for the world economy. Uh, the Wall Street crash uh, had happened uh, the year before, and um, uh, Europe, uh, the US, and uh, beyond uh, were at the throes uh, of the Great Depression. So uh, Keynes uh, penned this article and um, he pointed out that uh, we are afflicted with a new disease uh, of which some readers may not yet have heard the name, which is technological unemployment. What is technological unemployment? Well, it's unemployment due to our discovery of ways to economize on the use of labor. And he wrote this wonderful phrase that, you know, technological unemployment will only happen if our discovery of ways to economize on labor will outrun, will run faster than the pace at which we can find new uses of labor. And that was a wonderful insight that others after him more recently uh, took uh, in consideration. Keynes didn't think that uh, the future was particularly bleak uh, because of technological unemployment. He thought, that uh, you know, that's only a temporary blip. Um, in the longer run, uh, technological progress means that mankind is solving its economic problem, which is to feed and, and house and keep in relative comfort so many billions of people. So he went on to predict that the quality of life, the standard of, of life uh, 100 years from the time he was writing, which is 1930, and 100 years will be in seven years from now, will be much better than it is at the time he wrote 1930. How much better? Between four times as good and eight times as good. So huge progress. And he pointed out that it, it may even not be foolish to contemplate the possibility that progress would be still greater, not just four and eight times, but more. And actually this, is this turned out to be largely true. But let's go back to Keynes. He speculated on how life uh, might be uh, when uh, our capacity to produce more things with less labor uh, improves so much. So, of course, there was the fear that, you know, an elite of workers would keep their jobs better paid than before and so on, and everybody else would be unemployed. But this is, you know, this doesn't have to be uh, so. It could also be that uh, people manage to spread uh, the butter thinly on, on the bread. So in other words, uh, to uh, share uh, the work that is still to be done as widely as possible. And he uh, daydreamed, really, uh, of... Um, three hour working day, 
you know, a working day in which we start at nine and rather than finishing at five in the afternoon, we finish at noon at 12. And, you know, we work 15 hours a week and that's that's it. And for the rest of the time, we do other things. I don't know, we hang around with our friends. Uh, we care for those uh, nearest to us, our beloved ones who need care, uh, or we uh, embark on intellectual pursuits, we compose po poetry, uh, we paint, whatever, you know. And uh, uh, so Keynes thought that there is a brighter future uh, that may um, uh, materialize uh, if technology accelerates. But on the whole, uh, most people uh, thought uh, in more anxious terms of technology. And if you think that this is new, I have already said that it's not that new because it happened in the 20th century. Well, I should point out that in, as a matter of fact, uh, this is a theme, a recurring theme in the history of mankind, going back to at least the early 1400. So uh, I'll just uh, read out uh, two uh, texts uh, here. One is from 1589. Uh, the story is that somebody by the name of William Lee, um, convinced his local member of parliament in the north of England to introduce him to the queen because he had invented a knitting machine. And uh, he wanted to secure a patent. A patent is a means uh, to allow an inventor exclusive um, exploitation of his or her invention. So if you get a patent, you are the only person who can legally uh, sell uh, the machine or the method or whatever it is that you have taken a patent on. So uh, his member of parliament uh, was quite intrigued by the knitting machine that William Lee, who was a clergyman, I think, uh, had invented. Uh, so he uh, talked to Queen Elizabeth I, and they had an audience. Um, so uh, this guy, uh, William Lee, uh, was very enthusiastic and a bit, uh, you know, intimidated by the Queen, uh, but he set out to show how the knitting machine worked and, to, you know, to, to sing the praises, I imagine, of his wonderful invention. And uh, imagine how disappointed he was when the Queen looked at him blankly and said, Mr. Lee, you aim too high. Think about the damage that your invention would do to my poor subjects. It would ruin them by depriving them of employment and it would make them beggars, right? So none other than Queen Elizabeth I entertained this thought that is so common even in our days that a technology that economizes on labor, saves labor, does what workers uh, do um, faster and perhaps more reliably, it can only cause mass unemployment, right? And if you go back, further back in time, there is this uh, story about somebody by the name of Walter Kessinger, Kessinger who uh, came to, went to the Municipal Council of Cologne in Germany uh, with a proposal to uh, build a wheel for spinning silk, right? Up to then, uh, up to that time, silk was spun manually by workers. So he had invented, let's say, a rudimentary machine. And what did the Municipal Council of Cologne do? 
Well, they deliberated and discussed with friends. <laughs> we don't know who they were. Probably, uh, you know, the friends of the members of the municipal council, and they have concluded that the people in the city who spin silk for a living would be ruined. So the council declared that no spinning wheel will ever be built and installed. Not now, not at any time thereafter. So it's as if they legislated that there will be no technological progress in Cologne. And of course, we know that that was not the case. There was a lot of technological progress everywhere, including in Cologne. Because a few centuries later, at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, think of uh, the late 18th century, so perhaps 1760 to 1780, new technologies were introduced, which did just that. They saved labor. And uh, as uh, they were adopted and, and uh, you know, widely diffused, that launched the Industrial Revolution. The labor-saving capacity of uh, these uh, machines, uh, which look pretty primitive to us, was enormous. Uh, so for instance, uh, a spinning machine allowed one operator to do the job of 200 handicraft workers. Can you imagine? One single machine, the one you, you see in the picture, not very sophisticated by our own standards, but still, it could replace 200 workers, do what 200 workers did at the same time, and probably with more precision to fewer errors. So what do you think happened next? Well, some of the people who stood to be uh, displaced by machines, uh, some of the people who did what some of the 200, say, workers whose job was done better and more reliably by, by the machine, this that machine or other machines, uh, they didn't just sit uh, idly to uh, wait uh, to be uh, fired. They uh, resorted to violence. Um, there's this uh, historian, the greatest historian of the 20th century, Eric Hobsbawm, who didn't exactly justify uh, the violence, but he pointed out that at that time, uh, workers had no other means uh, to make their voice uh, heard. So uh, there was no collective bargaining, uh, for instance. Uh, and uh, as a result of that, uh, the workers went wild, they rioted. The so-called Ludite uh, rebellion, Lud was the leader uh, of, of the workers in, uh, I think, Nottinghamshire in England, um, lasted a couple of years in the early 19th century, uh, and it was so massive and so uh, strong that in order to suppress the rebellion, the British army sent more troops uh, within England, right? To suppress a, a rebellion of other Englishmen. More troops than were sent uh, in the war in Spain against Napoleon. Just, just to give you an example of what a headache the Luddite rebellion was. And as a matter of fact, by breaking machines, and uh, you know, kidnapping a few industrialists, uh, the Luddites were successful in the narrow sense that in the areas that they control, uh, technological chains advanced much more slowly. But in the end, advance it did. And to, to, to the opposite of what the Luddites and others feared, the fact that one machine replaced 200 workers 
perhaps paradoxically, did not cause mass unemployment. Quite the opposite. It uh, ushered in a, a era of unprecedented growth. And after almost a century, higher living standards were on. This is very uh, significant. Uh, economic historians uh, speak of the um, of, of, of a growth that had the shape of a hockey stick. You know, you know hockey that you use in order to hit the ball and score a goal. If you uh, put it uh, like this, you will see that human growth, economic growth, living standards were almost stable from you know the 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 year uh, zero uh, say uh, the era of the roman empire uh, to europe uh, in the mid 18th century just before the industrial revolution and then living standards went up very significantly and this is what economists uh, think of as creative destruction. Creative destruction was a term uh, coined by uh, Joseph Schumpeter, an Austrian economist who then migrated to the US. And, uh, you know, he formulated the process uh, by which uh, capitalism is such a dynamic system uh, in the pursuit of profit. Uh, industrialists and others employ technology uh, in order to steal a march on their competitors. And of course, that technology creates jobs uh, at the same time as it destroys others. The destruction is creative in the sense that, yes, all right, some firms go under, go bankrupt, uh, and some workers uh, lose their job, but that releases capital and labor that can be better deployed by the firms who are at the frontier uh, of technology. So the uh, laggard firms uh, go bankrupt and the firms that survive are more dynamic. They uh, use superior technologies so it is more efficient for those firms to use the capital and the labor that is released by the failing firms. Does that sound very theoretical? It's not. Think about what happened uh, even in very advanced uh, countries like the US or, or Britain or other European countries in which the majority of the workforce uh, worked in agriculture until the early 20th century. Now in most uh, advanced economies, uh, the share of workforce in agriculture is what? 5%, 10%? That's a lot less than it used to be. And of course, this is because uh, agricultural uh, firms today use lots of tractors and fertilizers, and other technologies so they can produce more food, for instance, with fewer workers. Did the displaced workers from agriculture uh, become unemployed? Well, perhaps for a few days or for a few months, but they uh, quickly found employment in, in uh, factories. Uh, and then when uh, advanced economies de-industrialized, uh, and uh, manufacture declined and services uh, rose. There was a similar process, uh, a similar transition from industry manufacture to, to services, right? There was, of course, a temporary disruption. And for some people, it was very painful. But in the end, there was uh, more employment than before and a lot more uh, production than before. And living standards continued to rise. Let me check how I'm doing for time. Not very well. So I better run. Why is it 
that technical change creates jobs as well as destroys them. Well, we know about job destruction. What about job creation? Well, there are different routes through which uh, technology creates work. Um, so for instance, uh, by reducing the price of goods and services, technology makes uh, households richer. Uh, so it increases the demand for all goods and services. And then there is greater capital accumulation. So productivity increases in industries that uh, have already saved on, on, on labor and the extra capital accumulation has no negative effects on employment, but uh, positive effects on, on uh, productivity. And the third route is that new jobs, new activities, new industries, new tasks emerge that were unknown uh, until a few years ago. And these are a significant source of job creation. So for instance, in the US, between the year 1980 and the year 2015, about 30 million jobs out of the total of 50 million jobs created had new job titles. There were jobs that didn't exist before 1980. And then there is this interesting story that when ATMs, automated teller machines, you know, the machines in which you put your bank card and money comes out, uh, when uh, they began to be widely adopted, everybody thought that employment in banks uh, will be uh, will fall right because there were a lot of banking employees whose job was to count banknotes right but in the US the opposite happened there were more bank employees who did different things so rather than count banknotes they talked with customers they advised them and uh, you know other, uh, more sophisticated things rather than just counting bank banknotes, which an ITM can do faster and better. All right, let me uh, add a few things uh, to the picture. So uh, the previous period, uh, until uh, the onset of uh, artificial intelligence, uh, the uh, technology that uh, dominated and caused so much soul searching and still does was automation, you know, computerization of, uh, uh, of uh, product, production processes, robots in some industries, and so on and so forth. So while economies, before used to think that uh, technology would replace low skilled workers. Uh, David Otter at MIT and his co-authors pointed out that this is not true. It's not that uh, automation will replace low skilled workers, it will replace routine tasks, you know, like record keeping or calculation or keeping files or uh, assembling products at the factory, things like that. And these routing tasks uh, are often uh, in middle skilled occupations. So the tasks that are relatively immune to automation are either highly skilled tasks, say medical diagnosis or legal writing or managing a firm, which robots cannot do, or they are low skilled tasks, but non routing nevertheless, because they uh, demand uh, the human touch. So think of caring for the elderly or caring for babies, for instance. These are also uh, uh, tasks that cannot easily uh, be automated. Uh, and you know what happens when uh, middle skilled jobs, say factory workers, disappear, and jobs 
at the high end, managers, doctors, lawyers, or at the low end, babysitters, mm, carers uh, for the elderly, and so on, increase, then the labor market becomes polarized. The middle falls away, and the two ends of the distribution uh, become more important. So uh, let's move to the present, which is about artificial intelligence. I started uh, talking about artificial intelligence. This is very new, of course, and there are many things that we don't know, but can, can we use what we've learned so far in order to predict uh, the near future? Well, you know, what happened so far since the industrial revolution over the last two and a half centuries was that yes there were more there were many jobs that were lost think of the spinning machine that replaces 200 workers but many more jobs were created and overall living standards were raised eventually so the fear that machines will spell the end of work uh, were not justified. Can we say that, uh, you know, since that happened in the past, it will uh, inevitably happen in the future? Well, we don't know. You know, it may be as a friend of mine who is a computer scientist and he's very pessimistic about the effects of AI, it may be that this time is different. There is a TEDx talk by David Otto the MIT professor, which I advise you to see uh, on this topic, uh, in which he says, well, yes, perhaps this time is different, but every time is different. So is it likely at least that AI will uh, cause mass unemployment? Well, I cannot give you an answer. I don't think anybody can, but I can tell you what we know so far. So one thing that we know, is remember what I said just now that automation, you know, robots and digitalization threaten middle skilled uh, occupations, but not so much high end and some low end occupations. Well, with AI, this is bound to change because AI is very good at answering problems in which humans had until recently a comparative advantage. You know, AI can do intellectual tasks. So it kind of threatens job deplacement in occupations that up to now we thought were immune to automations, like jobs in finance, medicine, and uh, you know, legal activities the legal profession. So they may side, suddenly find that they are at risk of automation from artificial intelligence. Has it happened? Well, not yet, but AI uh, is in a state of rapid evolution. And, uh, uh, you know, if uh, advances in generative uh, AI uh, accelerate, then perhaps this will change. Have a look at this graph that shows you that while um, at the bottom end, uh, the occupations least at risk of automation, more immune to automation, were business and finance, legal, educational. You know, how can robots replace a teacher? managerial or social service uh, occupations. Well, in the case of artificial intelligence, these professions are very much exposed to the risk of being replaced by uh, machines. You are talking about my job, for instance. You know, up to now, we thought that we were all right. Or some people thought that you know, professors are all right uh, because nobody can teach 
uh, a machine cannot teach students as effectively as we can. Well, you know, already uh, technology uh, affected uh, or threatened um, the profession indirectly through uh, massive online open courses, so-called MOOCs, right? So if you can watch a Harvard professor or MIT professor talk about automation, for instance, and effect, its effects on employment, why listen to somebody like me, for instance? You know, that's fine. And uh, I think that people like me can only claim uh, to have uh, to, to retain an advantage if they um, manage to establish a kind of personal relationship between teacher, tutor, and stu student. You know, our job has to be more, has to become more tutorial-like to guide students through knowledge rather than sit back and talk as I do now. But that was until recently. The only threat to the teaching profession, for instance, came from MOOCs, right? Massive online open courses. Well, now uh, the threat to our professions comes from chat GPT. If you can uh, uh, com compile uh, essays uh, rather than sit and read the literature and think, about the essay. Uh, if you can just ask ChatGPT and uh, it will uh, make a rather competent uh, attempt at providing the essay, then what is the future of the teaching profession and what is the future of education? Well, I think that we must, I personally take a more optimistic view of that. And uh, I think that our profession has to change uh, and also uh, chat GPT uh, must be uh, seen as something that helps students rather than replaces knowledge. It's like the calculator. You know, there was a time when students did sums and multiplications and divisions, not with a calculator or a computer, but by hand, right? Using the brain. Now, nobody does that. And you know there are some disadvantages to not doing that, but compared to the accuracy of calculations, perhaps they are rather negligible. So perhaps we could take uh, the same approach to ChatGPT. Okay, I'll sum up. These are the main results of the latest uh, study uh, that I mentioned earlier. Um, there was anxiety about the future, but also Two thirds of workers in a sample of manufacturing and finance firms in seven countries reported that AI improved the quality of their job. You know, they had more fun at work because AI automated either dangerous or boring tasks, freeing time to do more interesting stuff. For instance, there was this aerospace firm uh, in which uh, prior to the introduction of AI, uh, inspectors would sit in a dark room for long hours inspecting uh, jet engines uh, with a magnifying eyepiece, right? So it's a tedious, repetitive, not very enjoyable jobs. And it's very risky because workers who tire inspectors uh, after a few hours may miss a fault uh, in the jet engine. Well, AI uh, used in uh, a visual inspection tool uh, is more effective, uh, doesn't get tired, and uh, you know make, makes fewer errors, actually none at all. All right, the implication of all that is that we need new skills. And the skills we need is not that we all become or you become uh, AI experts, but that you uh, emphasize uh, your problem solving uh, capabilities. You improve those capabilities, your intuition, your creativity, 
your persuasion. And this is what both education systems, formal education, and also adult learning systems uh, ought to do. And you see that the types of skills that are needed in the age of artificial intelligence are not just mm, hard skills, but also soft skills, social, problem solving, critical thinking, judgment, creativity, and stuff like that. All right. I leave this last uh, slide uh, on uh, that sums up the results uh, of the uh, OECD study that came out a few weeks ago, actually a few days ago, uh, that looked at the effects of AI on the labor markets uh, of advanced economies uh, using the results of a survey uh, in, in seven countries. These are the main findings we have already mentioned, most of them, uh, and I think I leave that uh, here, and uh, I will end uh, my talk, uh, which tried to demonstrate uh, that economics has something to say on the most pressing issues of the day, perhaps not in, in, in the sense of telling you what the right answer is. Uh, in most cases, we don't know, or in some cases, we don't know what the answer is, but showing you how it can be used in order to think more clearly about these issues. All right, I'll stop here. I think I overran my time by a few minutes. Um, it's okay. Thank you so much for this wonderful lecture. I believe it was very, very interesting and our students learned a lot. If you enjoyed it, please show an emotion here or type something in the chat. I think it's really important to see your feedback. But or, ask, or ask questions if you have any. Yeah, of course. Of course, type your questions in the chat. We'd love to see those. Okay, they say that it gave a new perspective on AI. Thank you, that's very kind of you. We had a question. Given yes. the role of AI, how important do you think students should get a degree in computer science and would future job require such degrees? Well, obviously, uh, computer scientists are very much in demand, right? Uh, I don't know of any computer scientist, recent graduate, who is not employed. So if you like computer, computer science, then I think it's a very good idea to uh, get a degree in that. And, uh, you know, your chances of being employed will probably be pretty good. Uh, obviously, if everybody... Uh, becomes a computer scientist, some of the people may uh, find it more difficult to get a, a, a well-paid job. But the point here is that not everybody needs to be a computer scientist, but everybody of your generation, at least, should be a computer literate. I'm sure you already are. Uh, so if you are literate in computer science, elementary computer science, and perhaps basic maths, uh, even if you don't want to be a computer scientist, then provided you have this uh, rather basic competence uh, in, in maths and computers, then you can cultivate your critical thinking, your social skills, you can study any other uh, subject that you like and, you know, it's good that you choose something that you really like so that you can become very good at this. And then when you enter the labor market, it will be a different situation, but your adaptation skills will help you progress in the labor market, hopefully uh, in a successful way. All right, there are more questions. Should I read them out? 
Yeah, you can if you want to, surely, or I can do that for you if needed. What are three advices you would give us to start doing now so that we have the appropriate skills? All right, I think I have already given some answers to that. My my advice to uh, young uh, persons, either uh, aged, I don't know, 17, 18, or the... the and who who need to decide what to study at university, and also those who are, have already studied at university but would like to do a postgraduate degree, my advice is always the same. Don't calculate too much. Don't think, mm, computer science, I hate it, but you know it's good for jobs. So I will learn something that I don't like in the hope uh, that I will find a job that is well paid. Don't do this. Uh, you know, by all means, study computer science if you like computer science. But if you like poetry, study poetry, and make sure uh, you are computer literate, uh, which is also good. Your enthusiasm and your pleasure and your critical thinking and your creativity uh, will then help you. Uh, progress in the labor market by doing something completely different. I exaggerate a little, but you know that's the general spirit. So be computer literate, pursue your interests, things that you enjoy, and try to be good at them, right? Rather than go through the motions. I think that's the best advice one can give. Why does automation only lead to a loss of middle income jobs? Well, not only, but primarily. And that was before uh, artificial intelligence, which uh, as we uh, saw, uh, threatens uh, things that even lawyers or medics or even artists, painters uh, do, right? So these are high skilled tasks that are equally threatened by AI. I'll, I'll talk about AI in a minute, but to answer your question, well, automation uh, threatened repetitive tasks like counting at the supermarket checkout, right? Or even in a in a in a legal firm going through uh, the records to find legal precedent. You know how uh, courts treated similar cases. These uh, machines can do much better. Right, uh, you may think of these things threatening workers, and they do threaten some workers. Uh, for for example, factory workers in an assembly line, but others uh, it frees uh, others uh, to do better things. So instead of having uh, a legal uh, apprentice uh, do this boring stuff you know, going through the, med the legal records to find out how courts treated similar cases in the past or in some other country, well, you can have them do something more creative. Think about, uh, you know, uh, the legal answer uh, to a difficult uh, legal problem or think about justice uh, or think about how to frame a case in order to make it um, more attractive to judges, for instance, or, or whatever. So same in medicine, you know, rather than doing lots of stuff, which is not very creative, like uh, examining test results and trying to uh, avoid making mistakes, if you have uh, a machine doing that more reliably, then you can do more creative stuff, which is, you know, finding treatments for, for life-threatening diseases, for instance. Okay, what about finance? Well, I'm not an expert, but there is already quite a lot of uh, heavy use of algorithms in order, for instance, to pick uh, shares whose uh, tra trajectory uh, has been more promising in recent times. So, you know, think of the thousand 
of financial products that are available, uh, algorithms are already used, sometimes uh, blindly used by financial firms in order to advise clients. So finance is already permeated uh, by uh, digitalization and the same goes for AI. It does need cognition and real-time analysis, but this is only uh, a sub, um, you know, a, a small share of what uh, finance people do at present time. So hopefully uh, if automation replaces uh, human work in the boring stuff, then perhaps, as I said, in the case of uh, lawyers and medics, the same will apply to financial experts. They will think about more creative problems rather than spending their time in order to, uh, you know, do repetitive stuff that machines can do better. Who would bear the great burden of automation? Uh, I, I think that we know already quite a lot on this question. Uh, it is workers whose work tasks, in other words, what they do in everyday life at work, can be more reliably and faster done by a machine. So the more um, your job is creative and takes a lot of uh, not just knowledge, but imagination and experience and initiative and talking to people and thinking together about how to solve problems, these jobs have less to fear of automation. Perhaps they can use, not perhaps, certainly they can use automation in order to do their job better. <laughs> That's a nice question from Albania. Do you think that AI will help us improve our understanding in economics? I don't know. Could be. Will it be in a position to describe it better? Well, if it does, then I will be out of a job. But or uh, I will have to improve the way I explain things in order to stay to stay in a job. All right. Thank you so much for your questions, and thank you for your. I think I answered them all. <laughs> yeah, you did actually. It was wonderful. Thank you again for the presentation, and thank, thank you. you all for coming. Tomorrow is also a really, really busy day, and we wish you good luck during your exams. And well, thank you so much for coming once again, and have a great evening or whatever time it is where you're at. Thank you so thank much. You.